to Puppet Vikings. I'm I know the Boneless and today we went off to collect our new sword and we picked it up from its maker Mr Paul Benz and we had a chat. Here we are today with Paul Benz who is well are you classed as a blacksmith or a swordsmith or a master swordsmith? What would you call, call yourself? I'm just a craftsman, Gary. A craftsman? I'm a craftsman that makes swords and sword blades from history, uh, particularly. Um, all different types of period, um, from the Roman, late Roman, through to about the 17th century, I would say. Cool. Is there any particular period that you like producing the best? Hmm difficult question. It's sometimes, sometimes I'll give an answer whereby I'm in a different mood because each period has its own style and its own look and pieces from those periods tend to have a different feel to them. Good craftsmanship existed in all periods and in all cultures and I think it's important to respect that. The pattern welded stuff does give a lot of scope to a blacksmith with a, with a forge and a hammer and an anvil because the patterns are part of the manufacturing process rather than applied art afterwards. But yeah, I, I, I do enjoy making different swords and different knives. But the more, you know, the more that you do this, the more you realize quite the depth of skill that existed throughout history. And basically the bottom line is a good percentage of the time, you know, I certainly can't replicate the quality that the ancient craftsmen were capable of. And it's a humbling experience when you when you come up short like that. So I do like to try and portray, how can I say, the, 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 the bottom end of the spectrum, if, if, if that makes sense, Gary. Yes, um, fully sense. But personally, I've been doing reenactment for almost 20 years. And when I first started doing Viking period, everybody told me, you need to get a Binzi. If you want a quality sword, you get a Binzi. Oh, that's and very good to know. That is everyone I ever spoke to within the Vike and the various groups sung your praises as being the best swords out there. And to the point where it was like, okay, fine, I want one. <laughs> so I was doing Roman at the time, um, late Roman period. So I commissioned a sword, this one, which is a Spatha, a long Roman sword. And you made it for me. Mm. Um, oh, we're looking 2005. 2005-ish, are we? So, I have had this sword for almost 18 years. Wow. It has been in many reenactment battles. Um, and it has lasted. You don't get that with certain reenactment weapons. They will break after a certain amount of years. They will bend. These are quality. And it is an actual testament to your skills as a craftsman that I know that I can recommend your kit to anybody who's in reenactment and go, yes, these are quality, these will last, you buy one of these, you get what you pay for, it is. Hence why we're here today to buy a Viking period sword. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very heartened to hear that your sword's given you good service over the years. Oh. I, I, I'm, I'm I do enjoy seeing old swords that, that, that have given good service. I mean, there are many, many good craftsmen these days, and they're doing all sorts of, you know, absolutely splendid things. In actual fact, I mean, there always were good craftsmen. Um, about, um, I think, I think we have a individual craftsman working in small workshops. The problem that we have tends to be um, the volume of what I call volume of supply. Yeah. So, for example, you know, you, you, you make a sword and, and people like that sword, they like that piece of work. And around the campfire, people get talking and say, well, you know, wow, yeah, I, I want one of those. And it could be from me, it could be from uh, several excellent smiths and, and craftsmen. But you can't then replicate that in any, in, in, in any volume. Yeah, and what that does is it knocks on into a, a supply issue whereby you, you end up, if you take, certainly myself, I found that if I was taking orders, actually my wife came up to say, Paul, make something. Um, 
get some good pictures of it, get the weights and measures of it, then put it out for sale. Not to, you know, get people to jump through hoops for it, but they know that it exists, that it's there, that it's um, ready ready to be sold, ready to be posted. Uh, and, and, and you know that you're not snowing up a big back chain of, of orders, you yeah. know? Um, so you know, it's kind of like a, a way a way of working that that we've fallen into, Gary. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, no, it's it's perfect for the weapons to come up as you sell them. You're making the weapon, you're putting it out there, and it goes. And people are hungry for them. There are, as a general question, what do you recommend for cleaning? these swords looking great because I mean sure. I've just been using oil and mm. three and four thousand grit um, sandpaper um, yeah I mean the, I, I guess I've, I've found I'm, I'm not really the best person to ask and let, let, let me unpack that a little bit for you um, when I make something I will um, give it a polish and I will give it a, an oil over with ballast oil uh, it could be WD-40 and any light machine oil uh, or gun oil, but I think what it comes down to is the man or, or, or lady who has that sword, that individual needs to keep on top of it because obviously you know, we're in we're in Britain, a very damp place, um, both summer and winter, um, and you know iron and steel are very reactive metals, so it doesn't really take a lot. For, for, for dampness to get in, or indeed a fingerprint with the, your sweat, your salt on it, to be imprinted on the blade. Um, so I think the best thing to do is, is to is to keep the sword, uh, keep the blade in particular, um, oiled with any good machine oil product or ballastol. I use. I like ballastol. It's my, my favourite my favourite product to use. Um, and I think it's 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 more care and maintenance. Um, if you can get a good, well-fitted scabbard, um, my, my my opinion is not to keep the sword in the scabbard because, of course, you can't see the blade. So, for, for, for example, if someone was to take the blade without you knowing, or, or maybe you've done it um, because you're uh, in a hurry or tired or whatever, and you've handled it, and there's a thumbprint on the blade, you put it in the scabbard, and it stays there over winter, hey presto, in the spring, you're ready for your battle, take your scabbard out, uh, your sword out scabbard, and it's got a fingerprint etched in the surface of the blade. That can happen. If you keep it out of your scabbard, my opinion is that you will see the surface of that sword, and therefore you'll be more inclined to, to, to oil it, to, to look at it, to see it, um, and, and, maintain, and maintain it. But, you know, things get old. So, today we're here to pick up a Type M. That's right, yeah. So that would put it 8th to 10th century? I wouldn't go quite as far back as 8th, Gary. I might be wrong on this. Um, I think I think early 9th through to mid-10th. I believe that's correct, but these figures are uh, approximate. Um, I think the most important thing to realise is the type 10 is it's, it's a Norwegian type of sword. They seem to be much more common in Norway than any other any other country. It is very unusual, from my point of view as a reenactor, um, seeing this type appearing more and more. Right. Um, I'm more used to the tea cozy models. Yeah. Those yeah. are the, the ones that people tend to put out. I understand. Uh, yeah. You get a lot of them. There are so many. I mean, looking at the Peterson or the Wheeler. Yeah. lists um, the shapes and numbers are incredible but this flat basic it, it does look it does look, look peculiar to the modern eye and, and I do remember years and years ago when we were reenacting in in, uh, uh, in in the NFPS and with, with Phil Bertham and there were a few around then but like you said quite rightly Gary you, you, you normally look at a Viking sword with a full pommel this one almost looks unfinished because, you know, you expect to see two holes and a cap um, upon upon the end. But if those little holes were there, we would have seen them. So this is actually a type of sword, and there are there are a fair number of them surviving. 
Um, so if we look at hilts from the Viking Age, a good proportion of hilts have overlay and inlay of various types. Um, you can have cross-hatched overlay, you can have channels cut in for wires to be uh, hammered in flush uh, in, in inlay and so that they mushroom over and create a, uh, a very rich patterned surface of you know, uh, silver, copper, uh, gilding metal, or I they wouldn't call it gilding metal, they'd call it, they'd probably call it mess, messing or something like that, but uh, a copper alloy anyway, but, but extremely rich uh, geometric uh, uh, overlay later or earlier, um, they could have uh, sort of sinuous dragons and stuff, serpents or worms on, on the overlay, extremely rich. Now, the question arises, do you have a type, like the Type M, that, that to my knowledge, and I might be wrong here, but to my knowledge, does not have overlay on its hilt pieces, in which case, this is a better reproduction, a more faithful reproduction, because it is unadorned iron. Or do you go for a type of sword which the majority, not all, but the majority of examples have this rich over? So the, the choice becomes, how do you fit the sword with your the rest of your kit? Um, I mean, you know, if you had a, uh, a very over, uh, richly ornamented sword hilt, a pan-welded blade perhaps in the mid-period, uh, you, you know, you would really necessarily need, I, I believe anyway, to to have that status reflected in the rest of your kit. So you'd be looking at embroidery, you'd be looking at lots of silver, you know, a lot of it, and you'd be looking at a diverse you know, amount of different uh, artifacts or styles in order to reflect that status. So by buying that, it means you're admitting you're a poor man, Gary. It won't go with the rest of my kit, but as <laughs> I'm probably going to restart my appearance from a um, reasonably wealthy craftsman. Right. And becoming just a... I'm not a poor soldier. Right. I'm not a poor warrior. I've got mail. I've got helmet. My kit is all Norwegian-based. Well, that's, that's good. For that sort, that is good. But I'm yeah. a Norwegian living now in England, or in the Danelands, so I have come over and I have settled. So there are elements of local bits and pieces starting to appear. This, when I saw it, was a Norwegian based. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. goes with the rest of my kit. Well, that would make sense then, uh, Gary. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think if you have several pieces, you know, you, you can compare and contrast them and you can talk about them, you know, rather than just having the one the one sword that, that, that you, you, you know, you, you're stuck with. But I would say that because I'm a sword seller. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the Type M. This one we've got over here is... Yep, that's the Type, type L. L. The teacup yep. style, a trilobe. The pommel on this one is inspired by or modelled upon um, one that was found off temple I believe in in the Thames um, so it's I think it's a late late tenth or early eleventh century uh, type L now it could be anglo-saxon in style it might be uh, Viking it might have been uh, you know a lot of type L's were copied in Norway as well um, uh, anglo-saxon style from the mid ninth I believe but the the uh, Scandinavian lands, uh, they did copy it as a style, and it lasted right through to the, uh, you know, in some cases into the early 11th century. Now, I haven't quite got it right. I can, I've made several attempts over the years to get this sort of low-baited look that isn't, it isn't definite, you know what I mean? It's just not actually um, uh, demarcated by very precise lines. I believe it's a much more sort of almost fluid sort of progression from the lobes. But I do struggle with, with, with form sometimes. I mean, you've also got to look on it. What did it look like this way around? Or was it as bulbous as that? I don't know. Have I exaggerated that too much? I don't know. But it is a favourite style of mine. And well, thank you. 
We're about to lose the weather as we the rain are. is about to come in, and I don't want to give you too much um, polishing and drying cleaning, off. <laughs> but thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Gary. And thank you for the sword, and I shall pay for it in one moment. Bless you. But first, let's get rid of the uh, weapons out of the weather. Let's do it. <laughs> Well, we'd like to thank Paul for his hospitality, a nice cup of tea, and a very long, extensive talk, which we did manage to trim down a bit. Um, he's a very nice man, and he does some excellent work. So if you enjoyed this, please hit like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time for more Puppet Vikings. Yay!